Hello and welcome to the Risen Jesus Podcast with Dr. Mike Lacona. Dr. Lacona is Associate Professor of Theology at Houston Baptist University, and he's a frequent speaker on university campuses, churches, retreats, and has appeared on dozens of radio and television programs. Mike is the president of Risen Jesus, a nonprofit organization. My name is Kurt Jarris, your host. On today's program, we're looking at some interesting non-canonical Christian literature. And before we begin our conversation, if you don't yet already subscribe to this podcast, I want to encourage you to do so, whether you're watching on Dr. Lacona's YouTube channel, click on the subscribe button, or if you're following us on a podcast app, be sure to subscribe so you can get a notification on when new episodes are released. Well, Mike, uh, on today's program, we're looking at the non-canonical Christian literature, and uh, I don't know if we need to put Christian in quotes here. Maybe it's Christian by identity. Uh, the, the person's wanted to identify as Christian, but typically we see where some of the theology maybe in some of these documents can go a little uh, one way or the other mm -hmm. that doesn't align with the canonical uh, Christian literature. Is that, a, is that a fair broad description of the material you'll be talking about? Um, yeah, well, it depends which ones we're going to be talking about, I suppose. True, true, true. Well, uh, why don't we jump into it? And uh, first, let's start with the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, there are a number of uh, apocryphal uh, books, uh, New Testament apocryphal books, and um, you only uh, surveyed a, a couple of them uh, for your project here, uh, looking at the, um, the historical evidence for the fate of Jesus, so that would include his death and resurrection, those being the two big issues. Uh, so, what did you find uh, in the Gospel of Thomas? And, and maybe before you tell us that, tell us about that document. Well, the Gospel of Thomas is uh, basically sayings literature. It has 114 what are called lagia, sayings of, of Jesus. So, it's not a narrative like we find in our canonical Gospels. It's just Jesus' teachings in it. Uh, most scholars dated to the late first um, to late second century. Uh, so that's, that's a big, you know, time period, you know, about a hundred years. Uh, most of those dating it to the late first centuries are, first century are members of the Jesus Seminar. They're of a rather skeptical ilk. Um, but most scholars date it somewhere between the early second to the mid second century. Nice. And, uh, the, so the sayings here are the teachings. So there's, um, then presumably not all that much material about uh, miracles or other types of narrative events. Is that fair to say? That's right. Sayings literature. Um, and um, it, it's typically argued that uh, by some that, that this is early. They try to argue that it's, uh, it predates the synoptic gospels. And the reason they'll say is because it's, um, it's sayings literature and they'll point to sayings literature, which uh, existed prior to um, you know the middle of the of the first century, um, and and it it did it did, but it also existed afterward um, after the first century. You you've got some in Syriac that's later on in the second century and afterward. So just because it existed uh, before the Synoptic Gospels were written is irrelevant. I mean biographies existed before the Gospels were written. Um, but, but that's irrelevant. Um, you've got these lagia, these sayings, teachings of Jesus and Thomas that appear in a different order than we have in the Synoptic Gospels. Um, and they, like I said, they appear outside of a narrative context, like such as what we find in Q. Um, they're shorter and less theologically adorned than what we find in the Gospels sometimes. And they will argue, those arguing for an early date of Thomas will say that it's uh, the Gospel of John was written in response to the Gospel of Thomas um, because the Gospel of John tries to make Thomas look terrible. Like you, you've got Thomas that uh, right before the... Um, uh, Jesus goes to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus says he's going to go see Lazarus. Um, but this comes in the context where it says, wait a minute, in, in Jerusalem, they're looking to kill you. And uh, so don't go there. And he says, well, I'm going to go. And Thomas says, let's go so that we may die with him. And they interpret that as being Thomas saying that sarcastically. But 
I, I don't see where there's, why there's any reason to interpret it that way, rather than thinking that Thomas was just trying to obey Jesus and talk about his willingness to die with Jesus. Then they also point to Thomas, um, you know, the doubting Thomas scene, um, that try to make Thomas look look bad. But I, have, I, pr- I prefer the, the nickname Truthful Thomas. He just wanted to know what the truth was. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Um, you know, and the thing with Thomas, uh, you know, all the disciples, with the per- possible exception of the beloved disciple, all of them doubted that Jesus had been raised from the dead um, based on the testimony of the women. None of them seemed to have been expecting it. So... Um, Thomas isn't just the bad guy here. They're all that that way. And then you've got the fact uh, that Jesus may not be rebuking Thomas here. A lot of people take him as rebuking Thomas when he says, Thomas, you've seen and you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. But the Greek word that's used there for blessed is makarios, the same thing that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount. And more recently, scholars have noted that that, that term uh, can very likely, as it does in the Sermon on the Mount, means flourishing. It has the sense of flourishing. So what Jesus could be saying to Thomas here is, Thomas, you've seen and believed, but blessed are those uh, who have not seen and yet believe. In other words, the majority of people who are going to believe at, afterward are not going to see me, yet they can still flourish in their spiritual walk with God. So it's not necessarily a uh, rebuke. And then you've got to look at, even in John's gospel, you've got Jesus rebuking Peter uh, or telling him he's going to deny Jesus, and he does deny Jesus three times. But that's nobody argues, well, that means that John was also written to answer the gospel of Peter. Um, you've got Jesus answering Philip when he says, show us the Father. And Jesus says, hey, have I not been with you this long? I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, so, but nobody's saying this is uh, to respond to the Gospel of Philip, which is known to have been written in the second or third century. So, uh, I just don't find the that kind of argument for an early dating of of the uh, Gospel of Thomas to be very compelling at all. Mm. Now, uh, if you have the the sayings here. Uh, how much evidence is there for the purpose of your project? Um, yeah, I mean, not much it... at all. I mean, it's it, 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 there's no nothing good to show that it's early. There's some good evidence that the Gospel of Thomas is actually later, perhaps the, the late second century. So you had Nicholas Perrin, a good guy, friend of mine. He's now the president of, of, of Trinity and uh, in, in Deerfield. Um, and uh, he did his doctoral dissertation um, on the Gospel of Thomas, and he presented a, a pretty cool view. He, you know, what we have of the Gospel of Thomas is uh, you've got some, uh, you know, in Greek, but you've got some in in Coptic. A lot of it's written in Coptic. Um, so it's like scholars are trying to figure out: is there any kind of order here? Well, he translated it uh, into what scholars re- refer to as the Forlaga, the original in another language. So he takes this. And and what we have, and he says, all right, was it originally written in Greek? And he translates it into Greek and uh, no particular order. Then he translates the whole thing into Coptic, no particular order. Then he translates it into Syriac, and he finds a lot of what are called catchwords. So catchwords would link these kind of verses together. It's like Matthew's Sermon on the Mount is arranged artistically so that the teachings, once you become really familiar, you see how he's artistically arranged it and connected these teachings of Jesus. Well, you see catch terms like fire in in one of the lagia and then light in the next, um, or warmth, things like this that connects these things together. And if it's in Coptic, almost all the lagia, the 114 lagia, you can connect almost all of them together, which would seem to suggest that the Gospel of Thomas was originally written in Syriac. Um, and you say, well, where would this come from? Well, then he posits that the Diatessaron by Tatian, which is the Tatian, is the first attempt to harmonize all four Gospels into a single Gospel. And that's written in Syriac. And a lot of what, uh, Tatian, uh, what um, the Gospel of Thomas has is reflective of what Tatian's Diatessaron has. 
So then the question is, did, is the Gospel of Thomas aware of the Dia Tesserin, which people like Craig Evans and, and uh, Perrin would argue that it is. And since the Dia Tesserin was once around 170, that would place the Gospel of Thomas thereafter. But then someone could argue, well, maybe the Dia Tesserin was familiar with Thomas. However, it seems like as Craig Evans has argued that Thomas seems to be familiar with all four Gospels. And in fact, he's familiar with redacted forms of Mark. So like in Mark, I think it's 422, it says, for nothing is hidden except that it be revealed. And that's as awkward in Greek as it is in English. But you have Luke redacting it and improving on Mark's grammar. So it says, for nothing is hidden that will not be revealed. Ah, okay, that makes sense. That sounds good. Well, that's exactly verbatim what we find in Thomas, Luke's redacted form, which suggests that he was aware of Luke's version. Right, which would mean he was written... It was written after Luke, so you're looking at a, a later first century at a minimum, yeah, if not second century. That, that's correct. And so, but most scholars are dating it between the early to mid second century, but I think there's some decent arguments for a late second century. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, on your, your rating system here. Um, yeah, there's only two Lagia uh, in Thomas that even relate to the resurrection, and that's numbers 37 and 51. And they refer to disembodiment. They interpret resurrection as disembodiment and enlightenment, respectively. But not even the fellows of the Jesus Seminar think either of these lagia are authentic sayings of Jesus. So for practical purposes, for our uh, investigation, it's not useful. Yeah, not useful. All right, well, let's move along and see if we can get uh, some more with the next, um, the Gospel of Peter. Uh, that's a common one that maybe people have heard of. Tell us about the Gospel of Peter. Well, the Gospel of Peter, um, it, it's got a really interesting uh, narrative in it. We don't have the whole thing. The, the whole Gospel of Peter that we have is based on two manuscripts. First, you have the Oxyrhynchus papyri, which is four fragments containing 18 incomplete lines and dated to around the early 3rd century, around the year 200. And then you have the Akhmim Codex, which is dated between the 7th and 9th centuries. Um, this is from which we get most of the Gospel of Peter text that, that we have. And there are considerable variations in the Akhmim Codex from the Oxyrhynchus uh, fragments that are dated much earlier. So um, that should caution us right there that it's a chancy uh, exercise to try to base something about, uh, you know, an early text on largely on a, on a manuscript, single manuscripts that, that's dated 7th to 9th century. Um, and then what's interesting is you've got a resurrection narrative. And in that resurrection narrative, you've got two angels that come down on Easter morning and the stone rolls itself away from the tomb, and the two angels enter the tomb. They get Jesus. They emerge from the tomb carrying Jesus. Now, the heads of the um, angels go up into the sky, and Jesus' head goes up even above where the angels are. It goes up even higher. And then a voice, God's voice comes from heaven and says, Did you preach to those that sleep? And what's interesting here, who's the voice talking to? Well, as the angels carry Jesus out, Jesus' cross was apparently in the tomb as well. And that comes walking out of the tomb, following Jesus and the angels. And when the voice says, did you preach to those that sleep? The cross answers, yes. So you got a walking, talking cross. Well, um, so, I mean, this is typically you've got scholars would say, well, it, it They'll argue that John is much later and Matthew and Mark are later, uh, Matthew and Luke are later than Mark because they've got fuller uh, resurrection narratives, let's say, than you find in Mark. So you've got like, they'll say more details means it came later. But for some reason, they want to take the gospel of Peter, some of the more skeptical scholars, and put it against their, you know, everything that they do, their, their method for the gospels. They do just the exact opposite, and they will take the Gospel of Peter and place it before the synoptics. Um, moreover, you find the cross uh, in second century Christian literature, you find a cross uh, 
that is shown next to Jesus. It's portrayed next to Jesus. You find it in the Shepherd of Hermas, 2nd century, 4th Ezra, 2nd century, the Ethiopic Apocalypse of Peter, um, the Epistle of the Apostles, which is part of the Resurrection Dialogues. Um, it, these are all 2nd century literature. So um, it's more likely that the Gospel of Peter is sometime in the 2nd century. It is mentioned, uh, I think, by the Bishop Serapian in a letter around the year 200. So we know it was composed before the year 200, but it's almost certainly a, sometime in the 2nd century as a document. Yeah, uh, so clearly later uh, the, the story is, <clears throat> you know, if, if you're a skeptic, you know, you already sort of say, oh, this is just nonsense. Um, but as, as a Christian, you also want to say, oh, this is nonsense, even though there's miraculous happenings in, in the story itself. And, and, you know, Christians are not averse to the miraculous happening, but it just seems so much more legendary, you know, a talking cross. Yeah. Um, you know, that y you just become really skeptical. Hey, this is... This is clearly dependent on other material and um, not, not, not a value, especially for your project. Yeah, and you know, there's something else that's interesting here. Um, Serapian's letter, Bishop Serapian's letter suggests that this was being read in some worship services and um, he forbade that it would be because it wasn't written by Peter. It was pseudonymously uh, attributed to Peter, but um, there's nothing to suggest really that the, 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 that the church actually accepted it as authentically from Peter, but they didn't, those early Christians didn't seem to mind that you had these things augmented, an augmented story in there. Kind of like, you know, because they didn't have television back then. They didn't have DVDs, movies, things like that. So you were entertained through stories and they didn't seem to mind this stuff. Kind of like if you watch The Passion of the Christ and you see some of the dramatic uh, license that, that Gibson took in there um, with some of the things. We don't mind watching that stuff, and the early Christians didn't either about reading mm. that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, um, why don't we uh, save the rest of uh, the non-canonical for our uh, next week's episode, Mike? We're running a, a little bit low on time, and we've got a, a question from one of your viewers here that could take some, some further time to dissect. Uh, the question comes from Jonathan, and he says, In your article, uh, Is the Sky Falling in the World of Historical Jesus Research? That's the name of your article. You mention uh, Hooker, uh, Ladon, Thiessen, and Winter contend that the criterion of double dissimilarity should be abandoned. And they are probably correct. That's a quote from you, Mike. Why do you think they are probably right on this point? And so maybe first... Tell us, what's the criterion of double dissimilarity? Well, the, the criterion of double dissimilarity says that the item reported in the Gospels about Jesus is authentic if it's dissimilar to both Jewish and Christian teachings, since it would be difficult to uh, suggest that it came from the early church. It was invented by the early church, since it goes against what the early church would say about Jesus. The problem with that is that Jesus was a Jew, and he had Jewish disciples, and he spoke primarily to other Jews, um, and he often appealed to the Jewish scriptures. And Jesus was the founder of the church, and the, the, the teachings of him that we find in the Gospels that emerge in our New Testament, that they are alleged to preserve his teachings. So, you know, we shouldn't expect much of what Jesus said um, to differ from what's taught in the Old Testament scriptures and what we find preserved by the church. What the criterion of dus double dissimilarity does is it pits Jesus against the Judaism of his day as well as the early church that emerged from him. Um, so it, it might work in a, in a few isolated situations like perhaps the Son of Man sayings um, because the, the early church doesn't seem at least very often at all, to refer to Jesus as the Son of Man. They prefer Son of God. They prefer Messiah. So it's kind of dissimilar in that sense. And, and most um, historians of Jesus do think that Jesus actually referred to himself as the Son of Man because it's 
it's it's multiply attested. It's so mm. well attested. Okay, so now that we've got the concept of the criterion of double dissimilarity, now to Jonathan's question, um, why do you think that that criterion should be abandoned? Well, uh, again, because it pits Jesus against the it, the Judaism of his day and the early church, the te which preserves his teachings. It's like, okay, if if he's saying certain things and these are being preserved by the early church, why would we think that he would kind of say some things that go against what the early church preserves of his? Mm. Why would we expect that it would go against the Judaism of his day or 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 be dissimilar to how we know what the Second Temple Judaism was like in the first century. Mm. Yeah, he, he was an observant Jew, and so, um, you know, it just, it wouldn't fit to think that it's a good, it's a valuable criteria uh, that he's speaking against the things he identifies as. Yeah. Yeah, I follow, yeah. Yeah, so most scholars today don't, I mean, they might use it selectively. And another thing is it, it, it only can establish positive results like okay jesus said this but if it doesn't fulfill the criterion of dissimilarity double dissimilarity then you wouldn't say this renders it unlikely that jesus actually said or did such a thing of course mm. that can be said of most of the criteria yeah even even if you were a non-christian um you would think yeah that's the case if jesus were a good moral teacher and only you know a social prophet of sorts um he would still speak about his society in a way that he identified with and his, his beliefs being a, a Jew. So it's this, this criterion just doesn't seem to work uh, regardless of whether one identifies with, uh, you know, Christian theism or not. So, yeah, and you know, it's interesting. You do have some historians of Jesus, such as uh, Gert Tyson and um, Dogmar Winter, who have posited that there's a better way of stating this criterion. And that would mm. be the criterion of plausibility. Um, and they'll have some elements of dissimilarity in there uh, and multiple attestation and some others. So there's like two sub criteria that are involved in it. And, and I think it's a, a decent criterion that they are proposing. I think it's certainly better than the criterion of double dissimilarity as it's usually stated and used. Sure. Great. Well, I, I've learned something new myself here. Uh, so that's a very good question from Jonathan. Uh, thanks for, for listening in to the program and submitting the question. And Mike, thanks for helping us as we uh, uh, begin to work through the non-canonical Christian uh, literature uh, as it pertains to looking for uh, historical evidence for the fate of Jesus as you're looking at you know, specifically two issues, the, the death of Jesus and his resurrection. I look forward to learning more about some of this other literature on next week's program. Well, if you'd like to learn more about the work and ministry of Dr. Mike Lacona, you can go to risenjesus.com where you can find authentic answers to genuine questions about the historical reliability of the Gospels, the resurrection of Jesus, and a host of other issues that Dr. Lacona has written and has spoken on. At the website, there are loads of free resources, ebooks, PDFs, videos, uh, video lectures, uh, debates, even this podcast. If this program has been a blessing to you, would you consider becoming one of our financial supporters? You can go to risenjesus.com slash donate. Be sure to like Dr. Lacona on Facebook, follow him, follow him on Twitter. Be sure to subscribe to his YouTube channel and also to this podcast whether you're using a podcast app, uh, the Apple Podcasts, or an app from the Google Play Store. This has been the Risen Jesus Podcast, a ministry of Dr. Mike Lacona. 